And hello everybody, if it's noon and it's Wednesday, it's again a Penta Bar and with very interesting subjects. I am Mihai Zunt and um, we'll spend this afternoon with Sebastian Lorber on a subject uh, that's caught our attention because new things will happen. So records and tuples and how they will improve React.js. Um, we'll talk briefly about uh, records and tuple as a stage two proposal for the future of JavaScript. Then how records and tuple will uh, compare, you know, how is that compared with the regular JS objectives and arrays? Um, will underline this one, their significant impact on the whole ecosystem. Uh, and we'll have some demos, improving React and re-rendering performance and how to prevent re-rendering if it loops. Look at those more um, in depth. And we'll see some trade-offs um, on using records and tuples. Um, saying that, Sebastian Lorber is a React.js freelancer, editor in React Hebdo French newsletter, and a lead maintainer on uh, DocuSaurus, Facebook's React-based static site generator. I cannot wait to hear more about that. He's passionate about React, cross-platform, Jamstack, serverless, TypeScript, and functional programming. So we'll prepare for a very technical discussion now. Um, and I do invite your questions as uh, they will appear. Uh, Sebastian is an early adopter of uh, React.js since uh, 2014, um, and he has contributed to the growth and its open source ecosystem. Um, Sebastian, welcome and uh, nice to have you here, if you can hear us. Hello, everyone. Nice to meet you. Oh, I like your standing. So, uh, <laughs> and you're preparing to put some energy into this presentation. Yeah. Uh, uh, attendees are um, scaling up themselves, so they are coming in. Uh, we're saying hello to uh, everyone, and we're um, opening the questions starting now. We'll uh, address diverse subject upon that, but don't shy away from uh, from asking them. Just help us in managing them and put them in the Q and A answer. So to have an accounting, you know, on who we answer than not. It's uh, harder to follow the chat. We'll address that. Okay. But if you have the opportunity, just use the the, the Q and A uh, to be focused on the main uh, thread line of the presentation. Um, saying that. Give us a bit of a context, Sebastian. How did you end up actually working uh, on React.js and finally uh, with Facebook on that? Yeah, so uh, basically in, in the beginning, I was a Java backend developer and I was mostly interested in functional programming uh, in Scala and uh, I wanted to become maybe a, a Scala developer. But the thing is, I became CTO of a startup and I saw my uh, my front end team struggle with Backbone.js and uh, uh, despite the fact that I didn't really like JavaScript in the first place, I, I ended up uh, in this position where I uh, now only do uh, JavaScript. So this is. Uh... I heard that before. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that that uh, not the first uh, thing. So you work for uh, Facebook on DocuSaurus. Can you explain what's that about? Yeah. So. Um... The thing is, I, I'm using React.js since uh, 2084, and I became a freelance uh, four years ago. Mm -hmm. And I tried to, to sell uh, my expertise with uh, consulting jigs and things like that. So not really long term, um, long term uh, missions. Mm -hmm. And um, I was doing a lot of consulting last year, and I saw an opportunity on Twitter where uh, they were looking for a developer to work on Docusaurus. It was, it was not a perfect timing for me because uh, I already had some uh, existing customers and uh, they were looking for someone uh, right. And um, finally, the, they, they took uh, more time to, to decide uh, who they wanted to work with. And uh, they chose me this available uh, five days a week, but now I am almost uh, full. So saying that thank you for being here in the pentabars and with pentalog uh, it is our series of pentabars it, it is about spreading some you know inspiration and some knowledge on various yeah. uh, angles of uh, these uh, technical ecosystems that pentalog is working on um and uh, uh, saying that um I, I i would want a broad image on how is it to work on an open source project 
we've addressed this uh, from several angles with Code for Romania, Code for Moldova, uh, Pentalogs programmers. And uh, if you want, saying that, if you want to uh, see more Pentabars, my colleagues will put a, a link there to, to get subscribed and then give us your perspective on working on uh, open source. Uh. Yeah, so working on open source is not very uh, easy because, um, I mean, um, people think that because a, a project is from Facebook that there, there is unlimited funding to this project, but this is totally false. Uh, all projects have a fixed budget and and often uh, are quite a bit underserved with uh, too, too few people working on, on those projects. Um, and there is a constant flow of users that, um, that report issues. And as the project becomes more popular over time, like it is the case for the users, it becomes even harder for, for me to, to be able to answer to everyone. And uh, we also have a very, um, diverse user base. So we have people that are front-end developers that are using the users, but we have also academicians like uh, uh, maybe math teachers that maybe uh, create uh, documentation websites using the users uh, for, for showing uh, math formulas and they are not very technical. So um, you end up uh, doing a bit of support uh, to, to help them uh, get the framework or understand some things that may seem obvious for front-end developers, but they are these things are not obvious for for everyone. Um, so in in the end, I uh, I'm almost full time on Docusaurus, um, but I don't spend my whole day to to do code because I have a lot of other things to do, and I also uh, do the support to the to the users. I also try to to supervise the external contributors that are trying to to contribute to the project, and we also mm -hmm. have. Um, there is a, an organization called uh, Major League Hacking, which is somehow uh, open source internships. Um, and we have uh, currently three developers uh, called uh, Major League Hacking Fellows mm -hmm. uh, that are contributing to the project in the, as part of their studies. Uh, so I have to, to tell them what to work on, to, to review their work and things like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, so in the end of the day, I maybe spend uh, three or four hours per, per day to, to actually do some coding because the rest of the time is, uh, is spent on many other things, including the, the community building of, around the Cusarus and the marketing, like promoting the, the tool on the social mm -hmm. networks and things like that. Okay. Um, it's, uh, it's actually a very interesting perspective. Uh, I think uh, if we have that, and even if we do it on, you know, on fixed projects or classical projects that we have in IT, we still have, uh, I mean, it will still be better to, to allocate some time in the communication and, you know, uh, having the teams, forming the teams, having some time of, you know, aligning um, and all that needed. I see some raised hands um, uh, from some of you give you the mic uh, over the end of the presentation just to be mindful of everyone's time and if you have any questions just put them in the Q&A and then we can enter the discussions uh, so if you want to talk and explain some of the questions uh, we can do that uh, uh, on the end um, saying that let's dig into the subject Sebastian I I know okay. you've prepared the presentation let's see yeah. what Make. We have the first uh, um, action. They um, they've been taking Docuseros too for a test drive, um, and it's really awesome. Yeah. Ah uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, share my screen. Uh, I think you. I don't have the. Wait a minute. I'm trying to to see how I can fix that. Yeah. Now it's it is okay. Okay. Perfect. So um, I'm going to to talk about uh, records and tuples, um, and maybe you've heard about it or not. I don't know. Um, if you heard about it, maybe you you think maybe. But what I want to show you is what records and tuples. Ability, and I will try to show you um, examples to, to understand uh, what uh, 
the, the more interesting uh, things about uh, about Ricardo. Sebastian Law, my website with some blog articles. I was uh, earlier seven years ago, and I became a freelance uh, four years ago, uh, mostly doing uh, React. It's what I'm working for. So, what are records in terms of the TC39 proposal, um, which is currently in stage two? And uh, the goal is to bring immutable data structures actively to. Um, this is already a nice behavior, uh, a nice uh, addition that many are looking for. But I think the most underrated part is the, the component. Is an international working group that is supposed to to create proposals to 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 improve the the JavaScript language over time. So there are five stages. The first one is uh, to have an ID, but uh, not everybody can submit this ID. It has to be someone uh, from the the TC39 uh, committee. And uh, once the ID is there, uh, the, there are champions that will, uh, that will try to push the, this ID forward and write a formal proposal with APIs and examples. The, the second stage is you have a draft specific, specification, which is a, a specification is more than the proposal. It's written in the terms of, uh, of uh, the, the TC39 uh, specification uh, thing. And although at this stage, normally you, you also have polyfills and maybe Babel support so that you can actually try to, to use this proposal in a browser already. So for example, uh, recently the, the records and tuples just uh, was just added to Babel. So you can now transform the syntax of uh, records and tuples thanks to Babel. Um, the stage three is uh, when the proposal, the, the specification is almost ready. So um, we are trying to get the last feedbacks to, to make uh, some changes. And also at this stage, the TypeScript um, project will add this, uh, will try to support this proposal and add it to, to its uh, compiler. And uh, once everything is ready, the, the proposal uh, pays in uh, stage four, and it is uh, it will be included in the next uh, Xmas script version, and uh, everybody will be able to use it uh, soon. Mm -hmm. So le let's see what are records and tuples. I think uh, the best way to describe them is somehow they are very similar to objects and arrays. Um, it, the only difference is that they are immutable. So let's see a bit uh, more details. Um, how a record compared to an object? So it is a it has a syntax that is very similar to an object. You just use a hash uh, in front of the object to declare a record, and then it becomes immutable. But basically, you can manipulate it almost as a record. You can uh, log the attributes of this record. You can uh, log a single attribute of it. You can um, you cannot trace in a value of this record because it is immutable. But you can also update it with the rest, the spread syntax. So for example, you can create a copy of a record and mutate uh, one attribute of this record. And then you can, uh, uh, and basically over operations, you can do an object. So the, the tuple is uh, uh, almost uh, similar to a JavaScript array. Like the record, you use a hash in front of an array to, to declare the tuple. Um, and then you can uh, log a tuple like a, like a regular array. You can access um, um, an index of this tuple, like an array. And, but you can't trace in uh, this index because uh, it's immutable. And uh, this is also very interesting is that, for example, you know that there are functional programming methods on, uh, on an array, but they are also available on the tuple. So for example, you can call filter, you can call map, you can call sum, uh, you can call every and things like that. And you can also use the, the rest, uh, the spread syntax to, to update uh, uh, and a rec uh, oh, sorry, I, I made a typo here. Uh, it's a uh, it's record, and um, so you can also update the the tuple 
by, uh, by creating a copy where you mutate uh, a specific value at a given index. So uh, we have seen that there is a syntax uh, with a hash, but this is just a, a shortcut. You can also use uh, the, um, the record and tuple um, functions that are available globally. So basically you can call record instead of uh, using the hash syntax. And uh, there are multiple ways to create records and tuples uh, based on if you, for example, if you have um, entries with uh, k values, you can create a record from that, like you can uh, do uh, create an object from uh, from a list of entries. And the tuple, uh, although you can pass an array into send me to, to a tuple, or you can also uh, create the tuple uh, with uh, a list of values directly. So uh, about nested values, uh, this is also very similar to objects and arrays. You can basically uh, put a record and a tuple and, uh, and uh, having a recursive structure with a lot of um, records and tuples melted together. But there is something important to mention is that you can only put um, primitive types in a record or a tuple. So for example, if you try to put an object in a record, it will throw an exception because object is not a primitive type. You can't put a date either. You can put a class and you can put a function because all those types are not primitive types. Basically, for example, the, the date type is not immutable in JavaScript. So if you can put a date in, um, in a record, this means that somehow your record that is not deeply immutable. It is just immutable uh, at the first level. So what are the types that, uh, that the types that we are allowed to put in a, in a record? Those are all the primitive types from JavaScript. You can use a string, a number, a boolean, and, uh, and things like that. But also, the records and tuples are, all, are primitive types. So you can, this is, uh, this is the reason you can put a record inside the record, is that a record is considered as a primitive type. So you can use a record inside the record. So uh, until this stage, I, I just want to take some reactions from uh, from the audience. Uh, how is it for you? Is uh, are you with us? Do you have any questions? Uh, is it a good rhythm for you? Uh, can I have some reaction in the chat? And please prepare uh, questions if you have some. Um, and then uh, uh, yeah, all good seems to go. Go ahead, Sebastian. Okay, so uh, I'm going to talk about one of the, the most important parts of records and tuples now. Uh, let's talk about the identity of the objects and arrays. So if you have this code in JavaScript, you can see that you are creating one object, the first object and a second object. They contain exactly the same data, but the thing is they are not equal regarding the triple equal operator because they the two objects are different objects and they have a different identity. So for example, if you compare the, the first A attribute with the value one, um, as the value one is a primitive type, uh, if you use the triple equal operator, it will be uh, equal because one equal one. And uh, if you compare two primitive types together and they have the, exactly the same content, like uh, one versus one is uh, the same content, then uh, the triple equal operator will return true. But in the same way, for example, if you look at the, at the B attribute here, um, despite the, the B array being three and four, uh, those two arrays are different instances of uh, two different uh, array instances. So the triple equal operator returns false because those are different instances. So this is the very uh, important part uh, if you look at records and tuples, we can check the exact same behavior and we, we see there is a difference. So let's see about uh, what, what, what happens for records and tuples. So this time we are, we are creating records and tuples instead of objects and arrays. And you can see that uh, if one record is deeply equal to another, then the two records become uh, strictly equal regarding the triple equal operator because somehow uh, the, the records are compound primitives. So if they have exactly the same values, they are always equal. And somehow we can consider they, uh, they share the exact same object identity, um, which makes the triple equal operator return true uh, 
very more often than with a regular object and arrays. And uh, we will see later uh, what are the benefits of this behavior, and this is the, the very important part. So uh, let's talk about the interoperability. So what you, if you think about it, uh, the, well, the JSON only has primitive types in it. So basically you can put a date in the JSON, or if you do, it will be uh, as a number or as a string, and number of strings are, um, are primitive types. So basically uh, a JSON object is always convertible to, to records and tuples because uh, it only contains primitive types. So basically, if you have a payload that comes from your backend uh, through an API, you can always convert this payload to a record because uh, it, is, uh, it is JSON and you can convert it to a record. So now, are the records and tuples compatible with objects and arrays? Uh, uh, it depends because, for example, if you have an object with, which contains a, a date like my last example here, uh, you won't be able to convert it to a record because the date is not a primitive type. So you have an object that is, in this case, you can't convert to a record. So now let's uh, see um, how we can update um, records and tuples. For example, if you want to, to perform complex uh, mutations on, uh, on the, the records and tuples. So you can still use uh, the, the spread syntax to create copy of the objects at the records and uh, and uh, mutate some attributes. But as you know, uh, even in a regular JavaScript like we do today, this can become quite difficult to manage, uh, particularly if you have very nested, uh, deeply nested data structures. Uh, it is quite verbose to handle this. So we still need uh, libraries with records and tuples like uh, maybe Lodash or Emerge.js to, to be able to update uh, these records and tuples more easily. But there is a second proposal that is very interesting, uh, which um, is, is a separate proposal. So it will likely come later if uh, records and tuples um, are accepted for, to be in JavaScript. And uh, this proposal will uh, permit to, to make the, the syntax more, more friendly. So basically, you, you will have a, a very uh, a, a low verbosity syntax that you can use to, to update uh, deeply nested attributes more easily. So now I'm going to talk to you about the benefits of records and tuples, uh, and tuples in the context of a React application. There are many benefits, but I've listed only a, a few. Uh, the benefits are, for example, the, the security, the behavior, the performance, and the API surface. I will explain all these uh, in the next slide. So about the security, for example, um, you know that, uh, for example, if you have a React component, um, which receive props, you are not supposed to, to mutate the props directly because it can create a problem like React being not able to, to re-render when it should. So you should not uh, uh, mutate the, the props objects, but rather create copies of these objects and, uh, and call set state to trigger re-render. But now with records and tuples, you can basically enforce this rule and ensure that nobody will mutate the the props because uh, it will be forbidden by JavaScript. And um, also, um, it's also the same for the state. For example, the props and the state, you are not supposed to mutate them. So the state uh, is also another case where you have this security where you, you can ensure that uh, nobody will mutate the state. So for sure, you can already do this uh, today with libraries like uh, uh, deep freeze, which permits to Level to add uh, more to you to have this built in directly in JavaScript and uh, being enabled by default. So, another benefit is the behavior in different levels that can be fixed by records and tuples. Here, I'm going to present one, and uh, there will be a demo about this uh, later. So, basically, um, what Something that happens quite uh, frequently in React applications is the um, we have infinite render loops. Basically, what this uh, what happens is that uh, you have a use effect that uh, that depends on an object that is uh, created every time uh, you re-render. And the thing is, when this happens, 
you execute the, the use effect again and again, and then this use effect may be uh, called set state, and then uh, the and then the, the re-render triggers again the use effect, and you have an infinite loop, and uh, the and then you have an exception in the console, and there are even libraries to try to to prevent or break this. Uh, these uh, infinite loops, for example, uh, considered that uh, released a few libraries about this. And uh, maybe it's not totally clear, but uh, uh, the problem is not totally clear, but I, I have a demo just uh, after, so you can understand better what this is about. And uh, in this slide, you can use a router around the API filters here, so that, for example, if the user filter and the company filter didn't change, then the, the API filter will be the exact same object as before actually a record and then the use effect will not trigger again and again because it will be exactly the same so basically the use effect will only uh, re-execute when one of the actual two filters had a, had a meaningful change like uh, the user filter or the company filter was updated and you won't have an infinite loop for nothing so about the performance it's a bit uh, the a bit uh, similar um, somehow I'd like to think about it as uh, auto memorization somehow because um, as the object identities, actually the record identities are much stable because if the, the content is the same, then the record is the same. Uh, you can uh, leverage uh, more efficiently the, the memorization uh, things of React like uh, React Memo, which permits to optimize the, the rendering performance. Um, if, you, if the component uh, receives exactly the same uh, the same props, and uh, also if you use use memo, you can also um, have better memoization if you use use memo because uh, because the the dependencies of use memo will be somehow more stable, and um, and the the, use, the memoization uh, create uh, create function will uh, will run uh, less often. I also have a demo for this, so if it's not clear, I will. Uh, you will understand better later. So about the API surface, uh, I think this is interesting to, to use with TypeScript because uh, you will be able to express as the component props that, um, that a prop is expected to be a record instead of an object. And this means that basically you can enforce that the component should receive records, uh, which means that maybe the component care about receiving stable object identities because there are kind of um, there are a lot of rag bugs that are related to uh, a component that expects to receive stable identities, but unfortunately the parent component will uh, pass unstable uh, identities of the objects, and then uh, there are uh, side effects like uh, use effects that uh, are re-rendering or infinite loops and things like that. But the contract is a bit uh, implicit that a component. Um, expect stable identities. And I think a text script will help make this explicit. So here I am using the type immutable record, but this is an invention because it doesn't exist yet. Um, maybe there will be a different syntax. I don't know what will what will be the, the type script syntax for the record because there is already a record in type script. So somehow there is a conflict. I'm going to present you two demos now. Let me prepare my... Uh, so um, here I have a very simple application. So basically the user list and uh, for each item of this list, I'm going to, um, to render the, each, uh, each user of this list. And now I have an application which is basically a little application which has filters. Um, we have a we have a list of users with a name and a sex, and we will, we are going to to fetch a payload from the backend with a filtered list of users according to our filters. So, for example, if I if I uh, select um, the sex uh, the sex the sex uh, male, I, I will only get the the male users, and female will only get the female users. And um, I will, I'm going to fetch this uh, this user list from the backend using this code, uh, which uh, will run every time the filters are changing. So now I'm going to run this application so that you, you can see the problem, but is maybe not obvious at first. But 
what we can see here is that we have an infinite loop. So you can see on my uh, on the application rendered that um, the render counter increase over time. This means that like every second, um, the application re-renders, and we can also see in the logs here that the, the logs that say uh, calling fetch users and calling uh, set users are called constantly every second. This is basically because I, um, I simulated the uh, an API by can the delay of one second uh, when you fetch the, the data. So why does this happen? So this happens because of this line. Here you can see that you have a filter right here and it aggregates the name filter and the sex filter. And the thing is, um, this creates a new object instance every time you run this line. So this is every render, it is a different object. It is not the same object. And this filter object here uh, we, is a dependency of the use effect here. And as it is a dependency as and it changes every time, then the use effect will re-render constantly. And uh, you will have uh, the, the fetch that will be re-triggered. And then you will have the set users that will be re-triggered. And as the set users will trigger a re-render, then the filters will change again and again and again and again. And this is what uh, is causing an infinite loop. Just to, to show a bit about the UI here, you can uh, just wanted to show that it works. So for example, if I just want to, to see the mail of female uh, users, you can see it works. And I can also filter by uh, a letter, for example, if I want uh, to filter by the S letter. So how do we think that? We can fix that by using a record. So for example, here you can see that this is the problematic line because we are creating the filter every time. For example, the, the thing is we are creating a new filter object every time, despite the fact that we, we don't even actually change the filters. For example, here you can see that my input is empty here and, and the, the select for male female is also empty. So we don't change these two filters, but yet the filters object is different each time. Now what happens if we use a record instead, we will have a, a filters object that doesn't change every time because the, the data that it contains will be exactly the same as before. So for example, if I put the hash of a record here, what you can see here is that now the, the counters here don't increase anymore because the filters object doesn't, um, doesn't change anymore. And you can also see that we don't fetch uh, the, you, we don't re-execute the, the effect every time because the filters object is, is now more stable than before. But if we change, it still works, for example, if I, if I select the, the mail uh, filter here, we can see that the, the list updated and we can see that the, the, exe the effect executed and I was able to, to refetch the data like it should be. So in this case, we can see that we have uh, successfully uh, uh, avoided uh, an infinite render loop by using a record. And I think by default, uh, just using records everywhere uh, in many places where you don't, where you only have primitive types, you will um, we, you will save yourself for, from a large quantity of uh, React related bugs that uh, that are a bit subtle to to handle normally. So uh, there are implementation details on, of uh, this um, this demo, but they are not very important. Basically, I, I simulate a backend and and some backend filtering. And uh, although I try to make the, the demo more concise, and I also have some code to, to count the, the re-renders to, to make them appear on the UI. So now let's see another demo. Um, this uh, is- Just before starting, I, I'm seeing uh, a lot of um, nice reactions there. Uh, so uh, apparently there's a good connection. Like, okay. The audience. Uh, do, you, do you have any questions? Please uh, uh, drop them down if you have uh, here in the Q&A on the, or the chat. And I've seen some messages that uh, some had to drop, uh, but this is very beautiful. So if you are in that situation, make sure you subscribe on the link that my colleagues have put to have access to uh, the recording and uh, to uh, some others uh, pentabuzz like this. Let's go for the right link. No questions uh, until now. Okay, 
So now I'm going to show a different demo. This is not about uh, infinite loops, but this is about optimizing the, the right rendering performance, particularly when you refetch data. We will see uh, why it matters. Actually, so we, we do, sorry for stopping you. Uh, yeah. We do have a question. Uh, I just needed some time to typing uh, and that will help you also to take a zip or something. Can you can we use memo? instead of uh, uh, for, for, for the filter here yeah, yeah so basically yeah we can use memo but I think it's it's a less idiomatic for example um, I, I've written a lot of times this kind of code uh, I don't think sorry you can write something like that okay so um, so basically, this this will have a very similar. Um, wait, I have something. Yeah, I have. A, okay, so this is, this will have a very similar effect and prevent re-renders. But the thing is, this is not very uh, idiomatic to think about writing this. I think uh, just using a hash is uh, um, is something people will actually remember because, I mean, this is very verbose just to to answer that uh, the identity of the object is stable over time. While you can just use the hash and uh, and call it for the day. And uh, I, I hope you can see also the questions, uh, Sebastian. That um, is a. Um, another one is what I, I, I can't see them. I think because I am sharing my screen. I, at least I don't know. Uh, don't you know, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you. But I mean, if I uh, if I mispronounce anything, so. Uh, Matthias is asking, you know, what happens if you put sex and name directly in the dependency array uh, and then use uh, effect yeah. and pass I, I, the fetch yeah. directly? Actually, this will work, but um, the thing is, I think it's more verbose. And uh, here it's a very simple example because you just have two filters, but sometimes you are using multiple filters that are, that are, um, and, and you end up with a very long list of uh, a dependency array. So this is uh, complicated to, to handle at scale. And also sometimes uh, the, the filters will actually not come from uh, the state, but for, for example, from the query string. So basically you will read the query string with a library like uh, uh, NPM, there is a library called query string or QS. And this will give you an object and then uh, this object Every time you read from the query string, you will have a new object. So basically, you will end up with a very similar project where a uh, problem where uh, the new object instance for your your filter objects uh, will change and will trigger uh, the use effect again and again. So basically, if, if you read from a query string, um, you can basically read from the query string directly as a record. So that actually, if the query string filters never change, then you don't re execute the effect. So uh, thank you for breaking the ice, uh, guys and gals. Uh, we have still three more questions and maybe coming. Uh, Jamaldin is asking, how about records inside uh, should a <coughs> component uh, update with false return? Uh, um, honestly, I, uh, I, it's been many years that I didn't need to use should component update. Now I am only using a uh, React hooks and uh, functional components. So um, I don't think uh, there is anything uh, different. I mean, the object identities will be more stable, so you can implement component update uh, more easily with this. Um, but um, this is not something I'm re uh, uh, I'd recommend. I think it's better to just uh, use uh, the, the functional uh, form of the functions. And uh, most of the case, you just need the pure, pure component if you want to use uh, components. But um, I think uh, using functional uh, the functional form of functions is good enough now to use uh, in most cases. And uh, two about performance. What about performances use memo versus records? Um, the, uh, this is complicated to answer because uh, the, this feature is not yet implemented in the browser, so we just have polyfills for, for now. Uh, but uh, I think there are browser tests uh, currently, and it's not uh, clear exactly how. Uh, I mean, the, the implementation details are not specified, so uh, it, the performance can vary, uh, it can be different across the browsers. 
Okay. But um, the, the thing is, when you when you create records and tuples, maybe you will be able to uh, to to compare the the content of the record ahead of time, and um, once you do it, uh, it will be uh, stable every time. While if you use Memo, uh, you will do this comparison every time you re-render. So uh, there is a trade-off, but it is complicated to, to be sure exactly without uh, measuring the performance and having an actual implementation be available. OK. And the other one, what are the performance implications of using immutable data structures? Is, is there currently any work done on V8 or Spider Monkey? Uh, this is a quite similar question, so I, I don't think I can answer that because okay. uh, I've asked the, the proposal authors and uh, they told me that uh, there were some tests in their browser for a real implementation, but now uh, we can't like, we just have a polyfill, so uh, we can't uh, really uh, be sure about the performances because it will depend on the, the how the browsers make a good work or not. So, and there are multiple possible strategies to to um, to implement this for browser, and the strategy is not uh, is not uh, specified. So. They can um, they can try to to somehow um, pay the cost ahead of time, or maybe uh, pay this cost of uh, using records and tuples a bit more lazily when you try to use the triple equal operator and things like that. So okay. I, I'm not sure exactly about this point. So we should go next to the second demo and uh, see yeah. what that brings okay. on the table. So the second demo is an application that tries to render a user and a company. And uh, the thing is we used the rec memo um, wrapper. So that we try to actually optimize our application because we want to, we wanted to avoid the rendering uselessly. Uh, uh, the data didn't change. Um, we will see in this application, we are just um, fetch a user and company from a backend. And then we assign this user and company in um, in a state. And um, there is something interesting here: is that we are re-rendering this, um, we are refetching this data every one second. So this is something that is quite common in uh, in the in the backup to refresh the data because uh, maybe someone did some change and maybe, uh, maybe the, the user went for lunch and uh, come back uh, one hour later and you want to be sure that uh, he's still uh, fresh data on the screen. So maybe you want to, to, to refresh periodically or maybe when the, the browser focus the window again, you want to refresh the data so that uh, it, is, uh, it is recent. So we are going to render this application and what we can see um, is um, the, the render counter keeps increasing over time because there is a problem. We tried very hard to, to use write memo to optimize this application, but the thing is it constantly renders. So what can be the reason? Uh, the reason is that when you fetch data from your backend, uh, every time you pass uh, the, the JSON body from the, the backend payload, even if the data didn't change, you end up with a new payload object. And it's even if it's exactly the same as the, the previous payload, because the data on the backend is unchanged, uh, you end up with the, the new object identity. And this new object identity um, is set in the state. And then um, the React memo see that there is a new user and company props object that is passed to the, the user and company uh, component. And then uh, the, the, the React memo doesn't work because it is a new different object instance every time. So again, this is a, um, this is a problem that can be solved with records and tuples. Just want to add a detail here. You can see that uh, I've put the, my edge in, uh, in uh, red because uh, I wanted to, to show that the edge is incrementing from one every five seconds. But the rest is fixed. For example, you can see that I, I didn't, I never changed uh, the from my company. Um, and we will see what it will be the behavior if you use a record instead of um, of an object. Uh, so here I, I have just implemented a very simple switch, which basically uh, it's a toggle a boolean, and instead of fetching a record, instead of fetching an object, I'm fetching a record. 
So we are going to toggle this boolean to see what happens. So this time, what you can see here is that uh, as we fetch the record and the record contains exactly the same data as before, nothing will render again. But if, for example, the, the backend returns a new age for, for, for me, uh, then uh, the user component and all the parents component, like the user and company and app, will render. But the thing is, the company object here never change. The backend always return the exact same data for this uh, company object. So um, the, this component in particular never needs to re-render. And uh, basically, we have optimized the NAP um, a React application by just uh, fetching a record instead of uh, fetching an object. Okay. And as, you, as I've explained before, when you, when you fetch a big uh, payload from your REST API, for example, you have JSON. And JSON is always compatible with a record, so basically, you can uh, you can just uh, um, wrap all your payloads with records, and you you may be able to optimize your application this way very simply. Question: Have Mark uh, Erickson, the Redux maintainer, mentioned something about updating Redux with immutable records? Um, I don't know if he said anything about this, but. Uh, uh, you can put a record in Redux, and I think it has advantages. For example, if you want to ensure that uh, some data remains serializable over time, for example, you, you may use projects like uh, Redux Persist that will uh, persist the, the state of Redux in, uh, in some storage. Or maybe you want to, to be able to, to send your Redux state to the backend for some reasons or, or things like that. Uh, using a record in Redux can, uh, can have this advantage so that you ensure um, but uh, nobody put anything unserializable inside the Redux store. For example, you, if you want to ensure that nobody puts a date or a function or something weird in your in your Redux store, I think it's useful. I so think this the question. Yeah, we can go forward. So this is the end of this demo. Um, I'm going to. To launch again the last slide. Yeah. So um, records and tuples have some trade-offs. Some uh, some say that uh, this makes JavaScript uh, more complex. For example, they don't really like the hash syntax and and many complaints that uh, uh, maybe we don't need a new syntax for records and tuples. Um, and also, there are a lot of people that say that uh, JavaScript is becoming very complex to learn, and junior developers have a lot of things, and uh, things are not uh, like uh, they used to be. And uh, I mean, uh, yeah, but um, we are we we have uh, applications that are becoming uh, more complex uh, over time, and we need a real language with uh, with uh, advanced features to to handle uh, this complexity. And I think records and tuples is, is a nice addition that is worth to add to. To JavaScript, um, there are also some uh, some things that are not so simple. For example, if you really want to put a date in a, in a record, uh, you can't because it's a primitive type. But there is a way to somehow put a date in a record by using a, a, some kind of reference. For example, you can hold a symbol in a record, and this symbol will uh, will be able to to resolve to the 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 date that you want to put in the record through some kind of map of uh, of a symbol to uh, to that. So this is not very very obvious, and uh, maybe some people will find this um, this a bit annoying to not being able to put a, a simple types like dates in uh, in record samples. And uh, as I've explained previously. The, um, the implementation details of records and tuples are notified. So basically, you can't, um, uh, we can't be sure exactly how a browser will implement this and what will be the, the performance of uh, the implementations until they, they do this. So we don't have any benchmark available yet. And uh, also, as you may know, uh, TypeScript will implement proposals that are in stage three. So basically, the next stage is. Uh, means that TypeScript will implement records and tuples, but there is already a type which is called record in uh, in TypeScript, which somehow is a, is a type for an object. Uh, and there is some kind of conflict here, and we don't know exactly what uh, what will be the syntax to to use records and tuples in uh, in TypeScript. 
Um, so this is the having some questions i just wanted to announce that uh, the, a link for the feedback and to uh, if you want to get the tech trends for 2021 uh, please subscribe to the links that my colleagues will put there um, and uh, until you uh, yeah you take a breath for the conclusions and then some very interesting questions um, please uh, do help us to improve the setup bars and uh, you know subscribe for uh, the tech trends if you want to add them. Um, I think we're ghost. Okay, so yeah. um, I just wanted to conclude that uh, records and tuples are very easy to use. Basically, you put a of if it doesn't contain any uh, primitive type, you already use records and tuples. Um, immutability is cool as a security mechanism, but I think uh, this is not uh, the best part of records and tuples and really the complex behavior regarding the, the records and tuples identities uh, have a lot of uh, interesting uh, aspects. So I, I'm, not, uh, I'm not sure if I missed that, but uh, maybe, you know, uh, can you give us a time frame on how long um, um, will take this proposal to get to stage three and what we, can we do about yeah. that? Yeah, so actually just as uh, I just asked this before the, the talk, uh, but mm -hmm. the, the proposal authors tell, told me that uh, this is a big proposal, so um, it's not going to stage three uh, very soon. I mean, uh, as it is a very important addition to, to TypeScript, uh, they probably don't want to rush on, uh, on adding this. So. We can't really uh, expect this to be in the next XMAX script version, and it may take a few years before it will be uh, yeah. um, finally adopted. But so I think something ahead of time here with uh, you know learning about that. Sorry. So we are well ahead of uh, time uh, in learning yeah. about that and staying, but staying the, 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 the news. Yeah. So. But, I think it's uh, it's interesting to to know what's coming next. So this is why uh, yeah, I'm yeah. quite excited about uh, records and tuples. <laughs> I think apart from React, uh, I mean, go ahead yeah. and then uh, yeah. So yeah, so but, uh, now um, I believe it's possible already uh, to to use records and tuples already, but maybe prefer to use this. I mean, there is a polyfill. And the polyfill uh, may be of good quality. I, I didn't test it too much to be sure that uh, it is performant enough. But if the polyfill is uh, is good enough, maybe some people will like to use records and tuples already, not as a JavaScript uh, syntax extension, but rather as a as a library. For example, you can uh, you can uh, consider that records and tuples is just another library uh, in the same way as uh, immutable JS is, and you add records and tuples. In your project, and then you benefit from uh, some of uh, its properties. Uh, I mean, if the polyfill works, it means that you can uh, you can already somehow use this. It will just be a bit less performant than if it was implemented really uh, natively in browsers. And apart from React, can other JavaScript frameworks benefit from this? Uh... Yeah, I think there are, there are a few frameworks that can benefit from this, but I'm not uh, very skilled in other frameworks to, to be sure. Um, basically, any framework that can leverage immutable data structures can uh, can see benefits from records and tuples. For example, I think Angular GS, I mean Angular, uh, is, uh, is also using immutable data structures. For example, there is a, an algorithm called the change detection and push a setting that uh, tries to, to detect the changes of object to, to see what uh, should be re-rendered in a Angular application. And I think uh, here, records and tuples can have benefits in the same way as a React is able to optimize the, the rendering of uh, applications. So thank you very much, Sebastian. Thank you for your nice uh, French accent that was also <laughs> in the chat as you were uh, talking. Thank you for, you know, putting us ahead of our time with what will come. I hope to have you here again in the Pentabars. I need to announce because next week we have a very interesting Pentabar uh, in partnership with Microsoft. And we have two speakers from Microsoft 
talking about Power Apps and the new features plus some demos there. So some points will touch briefly uh, its custom uh, API, um, Oakdale, Power Automate, and RPA plus Ignite. So see you next week um, in talking about Power, Power Apps with Microsoft. Thank you very much for uh, your time here and uh, see you again soon. Thanks, Sebastian. Okay, thank you. Thank you, everyone.